I want to welcome you to Nature Connects. Nature Connects is TNC in Massachusetts webinar series that connects you with scientists, experts, influencers, and our partners from New England and around the world. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Deb Markowitz, the State Director of TNC in Massachusetts, and I'm your host today. Here at the Nature Conservancy in Massachusetts, we're dedicated to creating a healthier world for all. We work locally and globally using innovative science and scalable long lasting solutions to tackle the most complex environmental challenges facing our warming planet. We know that what we do here in Massachusetts to protect nature will mean a better future for all of us, for people, for nature, for all of us. We have an exciting program for you today. We're going to be chatting with Dr. Sasha Reed, a U.S. Geological Survey biochemist focused on understanding how Earth's ecosystems work and how they respond to change. She and the USGS, along with the Nature Conservancy, Northern Arizona University, and Rim to Rim Restoration, are attempting the world's largest scale cultivation of whole biocrust communities. Today, we're gonna to talk about the importance of biocrust. That's the craggy, often dark or burnt looking carpet stretching between shrubs and grasses in arid lands. It's actually the desert's skin, a community of lichen, moss and cyanobacteria that live on the soil surface of dry lands. This complex community plays an, astonish an astonishingly important role in sustaining the entire uh, desert ecosystem and also in protecting human health. But before we dive into today's program, I want to share a little bit about our guest. Um, Dr. Sasha Reed is a U.S. Geological Survey biochemist focused on understanding how our planet's ecosystems work and what factors determine the services they provide. Some of her primary research interests include understanding how drought and increased temperatures affect ecosystems, exploring a diversity of energy options for meeting national demand, assessing the consequences of exotic plant invasion and ways to combat them, and establishing novel management options for increased effectiveness and efficiency in restoration and reclamation. Sasha attempts to conduct research that's innovative, collaborative, and useful, and we're really proud to be a partner with her in her work. Um, Sasha received her BA in Organic Chemistry from Colgate University and her PhD in Biochemistry from the University of Colorado at Boulder. So as always, if you think of questions for Sasha during her presentation, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them at the end of the, the, uh, the presentation. So I just want to thank everyone for joining us, and, and Sasha, welcome. Thank you so much, Deb. I'm over the moon to be here with all of you. I couldn't be more excited. Well, it's really great to have you, and we, I, when we pre metal just moments before I noted that we're all thirsting for a little desert and the warmth and the sun. And Sasha told me they had a snowstorm. So, so no, no, uh, no webcam out your window for us. It's not, no, gonna... it is sunny, but it, we good. have a lot of snow on the ground. So I'll be <laughs> sending that warmth your way. That's good. Well, I'm really looking forward to hearing about this work. I have to say, um, you know, whenever I'm out in the real, in the desert, in the arid area, I like the crunch. And then I kind of feel like, Ooh, should I be crunching on this as I'm walking? And probably not. And so I'm going to find out about that ice. You will. We'll talk about the crunch <laughs> right now. There's something nice about that crunch. <laughs> the crunch is not, not good. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll think all about it. So I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen and my slides. Um, and we'll start at the beginning. So Um, does that look okay? I think you just need to swap it once more. Swap so. it again. Thank you. How about now? Perfect. Here's Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for coming. I, I really am just so excited to be able to share a little bit about biocrusts and some of the work that we're doing in collaboration with the Nature Conservancy and other organizations. Um, I want you to note here on the bottom left, I have the number slide we're on 
compared to the number of slides we have. I know we scientists can sometimes seemingly talk forever about uh, what we love to study. And so I wanted you to be able to allocate your attention and your resources mentally um, in the appropriate way. So you can keep track of where we are compared to how far we have to go using those numbers. And today we will be thinking about the biological soil crusts that we have in our deserts across the Western United States, as well as all over the world. I'd like us to be able to think about what are bio crusts and, and why do we care about them in the ecosystems in which they occur? And then finally, how can we think about actively restoring these communities and the important functions that they serve in the face of global change, like climate change, like land use change? And so I want you to imagine yourself in this desert landscape. You're looking at the red rocks. You see that there are trees and shrubs and cacti and grasses, but also all of this soil that makes up the foreground are biological soil crusts. They look like scorched earth, um, but they're really living organisms that are photosynthetic, that live on top of the soil surface. And they make up all of this inner space between the plants and the rocks in these dryland ecosystems. And they're actually a really diverse community of organisms. We have mosses here, lightly pigmented cyanobacteria that really just look like sand, darkly pigmented cyanobacteria, and then lichens, which are a mutualistic relationship between a fungi and a cyanobacteria. Those organisms are more different from one another than we are from the fungi on the tree of life. So there's community of real diversity living together on the soil surface in these regions where you don't get a closed canopy of plants. So anywhere that soils can see the sun, you see these colorful organisms, mosses and lichens and the cyanobacteria living together across really small spaces. And so this diversity can be really important and underappreciated in these ecosystems. We talk about biodiversity as being an important component of ecosystem resistance and resilience to change. Well, in many of the places that I study, there's more biodiversity coming from biological soil crusts than there are from the plants. And so this has been a previously underappreciated component of the whole system community. And we find these organisms of biocrusts anywhere that soils can see the sun, as I said, anywhere where you don't get a closed canopy. They're in Alaska, they're in all of the deserts of North America, Great Basin, Mojave, Sonoran, the Colorado Plateau, the Chihuahuan Desert. They're all over Africa, Europe. They're actually on every single continent on our planet. So these are a really big community. And they're, they're thought to cover about 12% of Earth's land surface. That's a lot of Earth's land surface for these little organisms that until recently haven't been thought to be that important. So we really see them, um, as you can see in this green hatched all over the world. And they play very important roles. Um, there are real soil stabilization components to biocrust. And this is a big deal for us in the Southwest. We have a lot of dust. It can be apocalyptic here sometimes. It can rain mud. And this dust has important human health consequences. It can carry disease. Dust is actually the second biggest uh, cause of deadly accidents in Arizona. Um, they can reroute planes. You can see this huge haboob, this dust storm moving across Phoenix. And so we need things that stabilize soils. And biological soil crusts do that. If you look here on the right, you can see these tendrils of cyanobacteria, and they exude this sticky, sugary glue that holds mineral soil, holds the sand particles together. Look how tough that is. And so when we can have biocrusts on the landscape, it results in big increases in soil stabilization and big decreases in dust and erosion. 
Biocrusts also play really important roles in soil fertility. And so here you can see six pots of soil. This is a top down view on six pots of soil. And all of that soil was mixed and was exactly the same at the beginning of the experiment. Then on the three pots on the right, we added biocrusts on top. And then we planted plant seeds in each. And you can see with your own eyes the huge difference that biocrusts made on the growth of plants. There are plants in those left pots, but they're so sad and small compared to the big plants that we see growing in conjunction with biocrust. And when we analyzed the soil at the end of the experiment, we found that the soil underneath the biocrust had much more nitrogen and other nutrients that we know are really important to plant growth. So another important role of biocrusts is to uh, provide soil fertility. What we found recently by doing a meta-analysis of published studies across the world was that dryland biocrusts also make soils wetter for longer. So we saw here, and if something is to the left of this vertical line, it means biocrust decreased that thing. If something is to the right of the vertical line, it means the presence of biocrust increased that thing. So we saw big decreases in sediment production, which is the same way of saying it reduced dust, just like we talked about before. But we also saw increases in soil moisture. In in fact, a 14% increase in soil moisture for ecosystems that had biocrusts. In these dry places, 14% is a real difference maker. So biocrusts are affecting the hydrology of systems in ways that are also going to affect plants, the recharge of our aquifers, the way water moves across the system. When people try to estimate the global importance of biocrust, they find that they can matter here too. When we look at deserts, these estimates suggest that biological soil crusts are more than 10% of net primary production. Net primary production is the amount of carbon dioxide that photosynthetic organisms take up from the atmosphere during photosynthesis. And so if more than 10% is coming from biocrust, the rest is coming from plants, that's a really important carbon storage mechanism. We also see that biocrusts make up more than a quarter of all deserts biological nitrogen fixation. Biological nitrogen fixation is certain organisms, not us, have the power to turn the huge amount of nitrogen that's in our atmosphere into biologically available forms. Biocrusts can do this, which means they're bringing fertility into those ecosystems. So we see at the global scale, they're playing important roles. And we're just now beginning to much more robustly quantify the contribution of biocrusts to things like net primary production and nitrogen fixation. So I hope that you have a good feel for what biocrusts are and why we think they matter. And now I want to talk about this last piece, this project that we have where we're looking for innovative ways to try to restore biological soil crusts after some sort of disturbance makes them go away. And we've known for a long time that different kinds of physical disturbance, such as off-road vehicles, energy development, um, oil and gas, cattle, me walking in the desert with my dog, we know that things can disturb biological soil crusts. And it's interesting to think about these organisms in terms of toughness and fragility. So in some ways, biocrusts are unbelievably tough. They can withstand huge wind, massive ultraviolet radiation. They can be dry for years and then you wet them up and they totally act like they were never dry. They're really tough in lots of ways, but they're also really sensitive to compression and physical disturbance. So they're incredibly fragile in the face of things that break up that crust, smush that crust, turn that crust over so the photosynthetic organisms can no longer see the sun. 
We are also seeing in, in climate experiments that we have here um, on the Colorado Plateau that climate change is likely to affect biological soil crusts. What we have here on this vertical y-axis is the percent cover of a very common biocrust type, a moss centricia cannonervus. And what you can see in the green circles here is the way centricia cannonervus changes year to year, not very much change. What we found was that when we changed the precipitation regime for centricia cannonervus, there was massive mortality. We saw huge loss of this moss from the ecosystem and they stayed dead. We're now looking at this recovery and finding that when we just changed the precipitation in this watered treatment here, the blue diamond, once we stopped that precipitation treatment here in 2012, we're seeing those moss communities come back. But when that altered precipitation happened in the presence of warming, a four degrees Celsius above ambient warming, we're not seeing recovery. And so this causes concern about the ability of biocrusts to recover after disturbance in a warmer world. When we just changed temperature, it took much longer to occur, but we also now are seeing large reductions in the moss community and lichens and other types of biocrust with a four degrees Celsius above ambient warming treatment. These are outdoor, um, pretty fantastic experiment, one of a kind that we have here at the US Geological Survey to ask questions about how plants and biocrust may respond to climate change. And what we've seen in the years since 2012 is continued decline of the moss. And this is what it looks like. So you can see the healthy, happy biological soil crusts in between the plants. And here it looks like I made a crust angel um, and, and physically disturbed this crust. You don't see the bio crusts anymore, but it wasn't. It was just from that warming or the watering where we lost those bio crust community types. And for a long time, we thought that it takes basically forever to bring bio crusts back after they're disturbed. And we're actually revising these numbers quite a bit, but 1200 years for lichens to come back, that's really hard to information to try to give someone who would like to see biocrusts return after their um, loss due to land use change or potentially in the future climate change. So we really wanna find new ways to try to speed this up. How can we bring biocrusts back faster? And so we really believe in the need for this biocrust restoration. If we believe that biocrusts are, are everywhere, important members of all kinds of communities, which we know to be true, if we believe, believe that they play critical roles in the functioning of the ecosystems where they occur, and if we know they're sensitive to different kinds of disturbance like land use and climate change, then how can we help maintain, sustain, and support these ecosystems in the face of change. And so we have been really unexpectedly successful with this team of scientists in speeding up biocrust growth in the lab. And so if you see here, again, you're looking down at pots of soil. This is how much moss and lichen we were able to grow in four months. That's incredible if you think of the 1200 year timeline we suggested would happen in the absence of our activity. Really amazing ability to grow these organisms when we can make the right conditions in the lab and the greenhouse. But none of those communities survive when we put them out on the landscape. We, we've tried all different kinds of deserts. We grow these healthy, beautiful communities. We put them out and we just watch them wither and blow away. And so we started asking questions through this really exciting experiment with the Wildlife Conservation Society funding and the Nature Conservancy, USGS, Northern Arizona, and Rim to Rim Restoration. What can we do to get these organisms to live when we try to restore them out in the real world? 
And so we tried three different things and are having fantastic success. So one is we thought about growing biocrusts from different climates. So we collected biocrusts from here near where I live, but then also from hotter deserts in the Mojave and in the Sonoran to see if perhaps hotter desert biocrusts are better adapted for the climate that we have now and the climate that we expect into the future. We also started growing biocrusts in an outdoor nursery. So we thought maybe we made life too easy for the biocrusts when we grew them in the lab in the greenhouse. They didn't get to experience the ultraviolet radiation. They didn't get to experience big wet dry cycles, big temperature changes. So they weren't tough and ready to make it in the real world. And through this project, we created the world's largest biocrust farm, an outdoor farm. And I'll show you a couple of pictures of that in one second. And then we thought about adding biocrusts as intact communities. So traditionally, the way that we add biocrusts to try to restore them is we crumple them up and then we sprinkle them across the landscape. And this is a good idea in that we're able to spread them easily across larger areas. And we're taking advantage of the fact that biocrusts can grow from very little pieces. They can be broken um, and still survive in many instances. But we were thinking maybe there are connections between the community members in the biocrust that we are eliminating that have a level of control over their success that we're, we just don't know about yet. Maybe they need each other and they help each other in ways that crushing them up is too much of a stress. And especially when we take them away from the organisms that they want to be living next to. And so we harvested from these different sites, these warm sites, and had incredible support from local communities of volunteers who were really excited to help us get some bio crust material. And then here's our outdoor nursery. We grew biocrust. So they do receive wetting in order to grow faster. We don't want to be on the 1200 year timeline. And we tried growing them in different ways, including on biodegradable weed cloth, which we found was hugely successful. So you can see the biocrusts here. You can see the water lines. And again, incredible support from local communities excited about their biocrusts, wanting to help with this work and wanting to do things like stabilize these soils. The third thing we did, which I never thought would work and, and did, was instead of taking these communities and breaking them up and sprinkling them, we rolled them up like sod and then carried them and placed them, we call them islands of hope, placed these islands of hope on our restoration sites in order to see if the intact community would have a higher chance of survival. And what we found is that it really did. And this is kind of mirroring what some other restoration practices that are occurring with plants where you're trying to bunch things together instead of distributing widely across the landscape you're you're recognizing that organisms might need each other a little bit more than we thought and and growing them together and putting them out together is really increasing their success so there's major hope for biocrusts that that I think we are moving forward and advancing our understanding of how to bring these organisms back after they're lost through things like land use um, and potentially in the future increasingly from climate change. So the things that I want to leave you with, um, drylands are really special places. And, and if you haven't spent time in them, I hope that you get the opportunity to. At first, they can feel very stark. Um, and at least for me, it, it was a little bit scary. It felt like an a piece of art that I didn't understand, but I knew was beautiful. Um, but with the more time you spend, you, you get to feel these harsh landscapes and the beauty um, that they provide. They're also really vast landscapes. Drylands are our, our planet's largest land biome. These are really important systems that cover a lot of our Earth. And biocrusts are a really important part of that system in terms of biodiversity and ecosystem function. The more we learn about them, the more we feel that they are making up a larger part of the system. We have some really exciting remote sensing work that we're just starting where we want to be able to use the power of remote sensing to tell exactly where biocrusts are and what those communities look like. 
There's also threats to biocrust. Land use and climate change are, are things that we think are going to continue to affect these communities. Um, and then in the face of these challenges, we're really looking for hope. We're trying to work together and think creatively so that we can take care of these places. And there's a role for everybody, um, thinking about biocrusts, recognizing the importance of small organisms, coming to the desert and getting on your hands and knees if you're able, and really taking a look at these colorful and important and tiny communities. Um, so with that, I would like to thank the collaborators who were a part of this project and all of you for uh, spending time with me today, listening to me babble about biocrusts. So thank you with that. I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see you. And well, that was really wonderful. Let me just remind folks who are watching this that if you've got questions, just pop them in the Q&A uh, section below. We already have a few, but um, I just you know, the work you're doing is just so exciting and groundbreaking, um, really innovative to think outside of the box. And I was impressed by the fact that, you know, as working for USGS, of course, you think in geologic time, 1200, you know, <laughs> 1200 years to fix itself. It's like, yeah, no, that's not going to be good enough for us. Mm -hmm. And thinking about human health and safety. But what made me, you know, you're so articulate about, articulate about all this. I was so curious about you. And how did you get to this position? Why this for you? You know, obviously you're passionate about this kind of work. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I, as you said in my introduction, I started in organic chemistry and I really love how chemistry lets me look at the world. Um, but after college, I felt like I wasn't working on things that mattered to me. Um, organic chemistry, I was working on carbines, which is the special type of molecule that, you know, someday will probably cure cancer, but I didn't feel like those issues were resonating with me. So I decided to take some time off. I was a ski bum a number <laughs> of places. I traveled uh, living in a truck for a while. And through that experience, I re realized how much I missed science. I really felt that draw back in. And at the time I was feeling that, I happened to be in Moab, Utah, which is where I live now. And I was able to get a job as a biological science technician with the U.S. Geological Survey. So you and worked your way up. <laughs> I worked my way up from within. That's and, uh, yes, I and really got introduced to deserts in general. And then I decided that I, I wanted to be able to ask my own questions and look for funding and, and do the work that I felt was important. So I went to graduate school, worked on tropical rainforests, which I still do, but the desert called me back. And so I was able to convince the U.S. Geological Survey to bring me here. And in my time here, just became increasingly aware of the range of biocrust, the, the large roles that were they're playing that I think because of their diminutive size, we really just hadn't recognized enough of, and we hadn't done enough to quantify their contribution. And in part, it's because of new technology, new tools that allow us to look at things in small ways, really fine spatial scales, really fine temporal scales that we're able to see better what biocrusts are doing. And, and so they, they really got me hooked, I think, on these little <laughs> little organisms that are are so different and strange and ancient um, but are also playing these previously underappreciated roles in the system well I was impressed in your presentation about just how much it matters and um, you know it seems to me that you know the health of the bio crust is really tightly connected to human health ultimately and and our survival thinking about the the uh, looking at those dust storms, for example, are, are there other factors that make you think that it, this is so, you know, relevant to our, you know, human survival? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Great question. So I think the dust is, is the most obvious thing that comes to mind, not 
only because of the traffic issues and economic concerns, but also because that dust carries disease and, you know, valley fever, lots of respiratory ailments are really affected by dust. Um, and so being able to think about those direct human health consequences, something we've been doing a lot of work lately with as well is the ways that biocrusts are contributing to the mitigation of climate change. So we talked about kind of carbon dioxide oxide uptake, how much carbon are they storing? Is that a carbon sequestration potential that is currently not in our models of climate change, as well as energy balance? We've done some really interesting work with albedo. So in the same way that we, we think about albedo affecting climate change through the melting of sea ice, ice well, is really- For folks who are watching, Thank albedo you. Yes. is sort of like the brightness of the environment. Right. Exactly. It's how much energy gets reflected back out. So it's not, if you think about walking on white sand versus walking on black sand, black yeah. sand is much more likely to burn your feet because yeah. it's holding that energy and less is getting reflected back out. So the same is true for bio crusts. If you think about their color it really affects the energy, but we're not considering that. So they could be affecting our species through their effects on energy balance and climate change in ways that we're just beginning to figure out. It, that reminds me of some of the restoration we work we're doing, for example, in salt marshes, where you know we may have gotten into it because we're caring about biodiversity, because salt marshes are so important. You know, for it's where all of those baby fish get started and all the little crustaceans, yes. the bigger fish eat it. You know, and 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 uh, and and then we think about it for sea level rise. You know, it creates a buffer for communities. But really, we're learning now it also has a major impact on climate change because. Because if we restore these salt marshes, if we store, restore our wetlands, then they become carbon sinks instead of methane emitters. And the combination is really pretty powerful. I would bet really you have powerful. that same story if you're looking, if you look for it. And Definitely. I think so too. Really interesting. So I was also curious, you know, first of all, for folks watching, if you haven't been to Moab um, and to the Arches National Park, it's one of the most extraordinary places in the world that I've been. It's just worth going to. So you're so lucky to be uh, living and working in, in Utah. I, I'm wondering whether or not you're finding there's a community of people around the world of thinking about BioCrust and whether the strategies that you and the team are coming up with for restoring BioCrust could actually be scaled around the world. Definitely. Great question. That is our goal. We, we want to come up with solutions that will work anywhere that biocrusts exist. And we're starting to branch out in this country to Nevada and California and New Mexico and Arizona um, in ways that we hope to better understand how the variability among drylands might matter to whether the restoration works or not so that we can take that scalability into account. We also have collaborators in Africa um, and across Asia where there are lots of bio crusts and in Antarctica um, to be able to ask questions about what are those communities doing. We're I'm part of a, a team right now when we're trying to start something called CrustNet. <laughs> which is a network for bio crusts where we would like other scientists and citizen scientists to be able to give us information about what bio crusts are there and to track that through time so we can better understand at the global scale what are bio crust communities doing how are they responding to different kinds of change what services are they providing that's the same across ecosystems or different across ecosystems and we think that that will be a powerful way to kind of build an international community that can share information to improve our, our thought process about biocrusts. So we've got a question from Vincent DeForno, who asks, does biocrust happen in deserts with a majority of sand dunes that shift all the time due to wind? So, you know, yeah. like, as we're thinking about like the Sahara or whatever. Totally, excellent question. We don't find them there. And the reason that we think is that the blowing sand covers them and then they die. 
And so what we worry about in some of the systems where we do have bio crusts is that if we get too much disturbance, we could go to a sand dune, blowing sand dune type ecosystem because the bio crusts won't be able to establish the ones that are there and weren't disturbed will be covered by the sand from the disturbance zone and then we'll lose that. There's also really interesting restoration that is happening in China on sand dunes where they're trying to stabilize the dunes enough to get bio crusts to grow in the hopes that they will stop being blowing sand dunes and start being more stable systems. So excellent question, Vincent. Yes, we don't see them there. We think it's because they can't get a foothold and there is work happening to try to see how that could change. And then if we think about the human health impacts of that kind of desert environment, that those sandstorms are really serious. I mean, Absolutely. they create terrible human health uh, problems. Yes, um, we've got a, a couple of questions about, you know, basically the crunch. <laughs> and one is, um, one was about uh, the ATV users and um, is there, let's see, I'm, I am, uh, how can we convince the public to stay off of these desert surfaces with ORVs? That's uh, Gary Gregory asked that. And then we also have a question um, from, I am scrolling down, hang on, uh, from Joan Ogden, who says, we seem so far uh, to have not been able to communicate effectively to users of our desert lands to not bust the crust. I like that. It's, it's um, true. Might we need to work with some psychological experts to figure out how to encourage careful approach to, to desert landscapes? Absolutely. All great questions and things we think about a lot. How can we help protect the organisms? And in Moab, it is such a beautiful place. It is such high recreation demand. We're seeing increased use of the landscape in a way that can often translate into increased crunch, increased crust busting. And so um, we do have a wide range of educational tools. We work closely with the Park Ser National Park Service, the Bureau of Land Management, to try to have information out there and we've had varied levels of success on different landscape types with that. We also try to create new ways to protect the crusts in terms of strategically placing rocks or trying to restore the crust so that it's so visible that it seems to make it less likely. Sometimes you, we just have this creep on the edge of trails. They get right. bigger and bigger. Um, and so how if we make beautiful crust communities at the edge, it seems to increase the chance that people won't disturb that edge. It doesn't always work. Yeah. Um, what we're practicing with, too, in some of our restoration is what kinds of crusts are a little more resistant to different kinds of disturbance? Can we think about communities that might do better in a higher traffic zone? Certain types of disturbance, there's just no way crusts will be able to handle it. But other types, we could try, we are exploring different kinds of communities to see if that could matter to the crust. And I think some of it, too, is you know, making sure our educational program isn't just what you can't do, but how can you move across the desert landscape to walk in washes, um, to think about different ways of transport in different terrains. So for example, tracks like tire tracks on a hill in Biocrust will create waterways that will then increase erosion across the hill slope. Um, but footprints won't do that and are easier um, mm -hmm. to come up with to for the biocrust to move in and to repair themselves. So thinking about those different ways where we can provide that information that isn't about what we hope people won't do, but the ways people can move across the landscape with a little bit of a lighter footprint. And I'm thinking now there's all the mountain bikes, like the fat tire bikes. And oh, it's, yes. You know, more and more outdoor recreation is, you know, is everywhere in the desert. It is. It's a um, big pressure. When, uh, before I was at uh, the Nature Conservancy, I was um, the, the secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources in Vermont. And and we we had a lot of hard decisions to make about alpine, the alpine crust, right? I think that's another bio crust. It definitely MIP. is. And there was this tension between wanting to really encourage people to get outdoors and hike the mountains and uh, protecting this really important habitat. And, and we would put up signs and I would say the place where we just never could quite control it was with dogs. 
Yeah. Love our dogs, um, you know, especially in the Northeast, but in Arizona and Utah, and these areas as well. And so keeping dogs on leashes became like a really big, important sort mm -hmm. of tool. Um, do you find that as well that that or is that less of an issue for biocrust? People I mean, I think, with animals. Yeah, pe the, the smaller the footprint we find, the better. So dogs are better at not making tracks and at having little paws, but they definitely have an effect on the bio crusts. Um, and the way in, in some high areas, um, we find that dogs can be an issue with waste if people aren't picking up after their dogs. Then that Which we know they're not when they're off the leash. Yeah, we know they they can't be in, in many of those instances. And so um, we have those issues. What's interesting about our area is we have these vast amounts of public land that are Bureau of Land Management, these beautiful, important landscapes. And the, the Bureau of Land Management mission is really multiple use. So we want all these different kinds of use. And that's where we're really trying to focus in on how could we kind of make that use better cited to certain areas where we could, could control things a little bit more, but still let people do the things that they want to do on their, their shared public lands. So what we did, here's the secret, is we didn't expand parking lots. Mm, so there's oh. a lot of pressure in you know a couple of our big mountains or a lot of a lot of pressure, a lot of hikers, and we just had no parking signs along the main, you know, the road oh, areas. And limited. Just kept those parking lots to what we thought. And you know, it, it's mixed results. People, you know, we're still parking, you know, illegally or hiking in from anyway. We did get a question from uh, Kate uh, Carisi. Um, when you see moss and lichen, et cetera, crusts in sand plain communities around the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain. Are these examples of biocrust also? Definitely. And we have some Ohio crust studies. They are absolutely biocrust. And, and they have been, I'd say, not appreciated enough in our biocrust scientific community as contributing to the larger biocrust questions. But they absolutely are. They're performing all of the same services. They're the same types of organisms. They're totally biocrust. And we think of biocrust as being desert things, yeah. but they really can be found anywhere that I've even seen biocrust in the tropics on road cuts where you just need that soil to see the sun and then these organisms can get a foothold. Eventually, they'll probably be shaded out by bigger, uh, by trees and shrubs and stuff like that, but they, they can make it there for a while. Well, Jan Collins asked, we've been to the Arctic and we're fascinated with the tiny plants and vegetation over the landscape. Is that biocrust? It is biocrust. <laughs> um, they are incredible. feeling that all you're going to say yes to a lot of these questions. Yes, we've got to these. <laughs> absolutely. It is. And, and we've been trying, there's kind of this um, in science, just like in all communities, there's there's different subcultures. And right now we're having a little bit of a battle about, you know, what counts as bio crust and, and do we need to have dryland types? And, and my feeling is it's all bio crust and we would learn more by explicit studies where we say, what's going on in the Arctic? What's going on in the Great Lakes? What's going on in drylands? What do we see that's similar? What do we see that's different? But they are definitely huge expanses of lichen dominated Arctic crust and Alaska has amazing crust, lots of mosses. And it's interesting because for example, in Alaska, the lichens are a really important food source for caribou. So it's not just providing the soil stabilization um, part. It's not just providing the fertility part, but it's actually a food source for wildlife that we really care about there. So, so I think we're increasingly thinking about managing for bio crusts in a way that um, maybe didn't seem possible 20 years ago. That is very cool. Um, we have a question about Australia. Vincent DeForno asks, I noticed that practically all of Australia is covered with desert. How do the wildfires there affect biocrust areas? And I wonder, how about our wildfires? We certainly have enough of them, right? Do. Is that a, a negative impact or awesome. is this kind of, yeah, okay, go ahead. Great question. We have a lot of fire science right now with biocrust. And what we find is biocrust hate fire. <laughs> 
<laughs> they don't do very well with burning. Um, and we've done, we have a set of chrono sequence studies now. So where we go to different places that have different ages since the burn. So here it burned 15 years ago, here it burned 30 years ago. And we try to see how biocrusts are coming back. And we see really slow recovery after fire um, for biocrusts. And the fires in, in Australia, the same, really negative effects on biocrusts. And then we we're trying to study what is it about the soil that may inhibit biocrust from coming back. But there are certain types of biocrust. Something um, is called fire moss that does seem to come back after fire. It seems to come back quickly. It's kind of a weedy moss, if you can imagine a weedy moss, but it grows quickly. And so there's a lot of questions being asked in the Southwest about using fire moss as a restoration tool after fire to stabilize soils, to try to reduce big landslides in the erosion that we often see after burn um, in these ecosystem types. So, so I'd say the take home is biocrust don't like fire, but there are certain types of biocrust that seem to do well that offer opportunities not only to bring biocrust back to the landscape, but to perform the types of services we often ask plants to perform after fire in terms of stabilizing soils. Great question. That's, that's great. And it sounds like the, that fire moss comes back faster than maybe a plant for stabilizing. Yeah, so. that's the hope. And they're, they're working right now on trying to pelletize fire moss <laughs> oh, no. if they can spray it from airplanes <laughs> across <laughs> big burns and get those little mosses to grow out. And so I'll keep you guys posted on That's that. Great. So I was curious, as you were talking about what makes up a biocrust uh, that you're studying, that cyanobacteria is part of it. We had a couple of questions about that. One is, first of all, is that nitrogen fixation that you talked about is a service of the biocrust. Is that happening because of the cyanobacteria? And, you know, in our lakes and in our, you know, in our bays, cyanobacteria is like a bad thing, right? It causes human health problems possibly, and certainly can kill dogs. And is there, is that, this sounds like it's the same thing in a different environment. Is it, does it, you know, are you, does it cause human health issues? Are we, should we worry about it if our dog wants to eat it? <laughs> Great question. I would say what we don't know about the human health effects of cyanobacteria from soil is a lot. So there hasn't been nearly as much study as in the aquatic systems. I think for the, the aquatic eutrophication, it's usually a human induced change to the cyanobacteria. So you Wait, get high. On, we, have to, we have to translate it. Eutrophication means there's not enough oxygen in the water. And so, and that's because of excessive plant growth. That's so. right. And so you get nutrients moving into the waterways and there's that those from like fertilization from fields or from other uses of energy development. And then that stimulates the cyanobacteria to grow. And then that sucks up all the oxygen out of the water and kills fishes and causes toxic algal blooms. And so we don't see that sort of change in terrestrial earth land cyanobacteria, um, though we don't have the same levels of nutrient addition happening. We do have deposition pollution, but usually pollution kills biocrust. It doesn't stimulate their growth. So we haven't seen anything, though it could be occurring in places. There's lots of places we don't look, but we haven't seen anything like that in the, the, the soil cyanobacteria. There's a couple different major types of soil cyanobacteria that we think about a lot. And the first is, um, if you can remember that picture of the cyanobacteria that just look like sand, we called it lightly pigmented cyanobacteria. And those cyanobacteria are the first to move into soil after disturbance. And they're the worms, the little tendrils hanging down. And what they have the ability to do is to move up uh, almost a centimeter. So when the soils get wet, they wiggle to the surface and photosynthesize, and then the soils get dry and they wiggle down. And that's why they don't have pigmentation. They use the soil as their sunscreen. So they don't need to have the kind of dark pigmentation to protect them from the sun that the other types of cyanobacteria and lichens and mosses have. That sounds so creepy to me. <laughs> <laughs> wiggling up. And sometimes the soils can look 
really green because there's enough of them that wiggled yeah. up when it's wet. <laughs> and those organisms don't have the ability to fix nitrogen themselves. They're not a type of cyanobacteria that can fix nitrogen. But what is being found now is that they have this sheath around them. So picture the, the worm of one celled organisms living together in a strain and then they have this sheath and the sheath which is now be calling being called the cytosphere is has its own microbial community and they have found some nitrogen fixers in there so very low levels of nitrogen fixation but there's other types of cyanobacteria um, that fix lots of nitrogen and those darkly pigmented cyanobacteria actually crank nitrogen fixation and add a lot of nitrogen in the system but we haven't seen any instances where that has resulted in negative outcomes for the other community members and in part it could be because our background fertility is so low we're never reaching those high amounts of fertility that can happen in the streams with pollution and so it could be that we would have the same kind of trend if we pushed far enough to that side but we don't see that right now yeah that's the least of our worries it sounds yeah. like at this point so we did get some curiosity uh some qu curious questions about um you know bringing in uh bio crust from other places and um, and this occurred to me as well, probably others who've been watching uh, Paul Davis asks, are there any invasive microbiota concerns when you're testing bio crusts from another continent? And, you know, all I can think about is, you know, all of the experiments we've done over the years, bringing in one species that all of a sudden gets out of control and out competes. And how do you manage for this? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. We worry a lot with assisted migration that we will bring things that we don't want. And so with the bio crust, we're very careful about where we put it and how we maintain it. And there are a few, because we're doing this as a study to see, we're not putting lots of bio crust from other places across, but there are a number of things about the approach that we, that we took um, that made us feel safer about doing this science. One of the things is that we never brought bio crust from another continent. So all of the examples of like Australia being the example of everything, thing is when you're bringing an organism that was never close by to a new place and then it has no natural predators it has no natural problems also there's no known invasive bio crust so it doesn't mean it couldn't occur but there's never been a report or a recording of bio crust acting invasively keeping other things out they're also very slow growing and so you don't have the same worry of kind of the you know seed source blowing out we just don't it, again it, it's a valid concern and it could happen but we don't see that happening in nature we don't have examples yet of where that could occur and it's part of what we want to study what we are are concerned about in addition to, to thinking about oh, and one last thing I wanted to tell you, there is some new genetic work that suggests that there are viruses that attack bio crusts and can kill bio crusts. So okay. there is concern that you could bring a virus with you accidentally that could then have negative consequences for the bio crust community. So we're thinking more about that. And the other concern that we spent a lot of time thinking about and really processed our samples because of that concern is that we could accidentally bring exotic seeds with us. Right. So there are a lot of exotic plants in the Southwest and everywhere that you don't want. And they're, they're moving around on their own, but there are places where they aren't yet and we don't want to be the ones to bring them. So we processed that bio crust really carefully and we grew it out in a number of cycles to make sure that we didn't feel like there were any seeds of plant species of concern. But it's, I think with all assisted migration, it's a really important point. And what we want to do is try to provide the information so we can make informed decisions. Do we, do we feel like losing all bio crusts is a bigger risk than bringing them in? Do we think we might lose them? What happens when we bring them in? We want to have that information ready. So when the time comes, we'll be able to decide one way or the other. But it's, I think it's an excellent point, something that we think a lot about. Yeah, I can imagine, um, you know, because you don't want to 
get it wrong. Um, but we've, we have a question from Keitro, which I really appreciate. It's about scale and how to scale up this effort. Cause it seems like these little experiments are great, but the problem is overall huge geographic area. So, um, you know, what is the possibility of scaling up these efforts? Kate asks, if you lay down one of your sod like mats, mats, do they expand from the margins? Does it take 1200 years for them to do it? <laughs> Otherwise, do we have to lay mats over all the disturbed des des desert surfaces? And I ask, is that even feasible? Definitely. Great questions. So we would not be able to lay mats everywhere, as you're thinking. I totally agree. Um, we do see biocrust expanding from the margins. So we, we are seeing that, but it's going to happen based on the climate and the soil. It will be slower. We also do sprinkle kind of in the sea between the islands in the hopes that there'll be synergy there and we could grow more, but we're still exploring larger scale. So with the rolling up of the sod, we did everything and tested it with the idea of what if we were using farm scale equipment with this? Could we roll this up with equipment to, to mechanize aspects of this process? But even then, I think with the islands, we would always be targeting specific areas, whether that be a trail we're trying to close or certain areas that need extra help. We wouldn't be able to go across Nevada with that type of scale. But the same is true for plants. We have a mix of seeding. We do aerial seeding, like the fire moss from plains, but with, with seeds, and then also plantings in places that we have extra concern about or we really want to be able to restore. And that's how we see the biocrust, that there's no, gonna, not going to be any single approach that will work across scale. But the question of scale is excellent. And we, we think a lot, we don't want to do something that's not going to be useful anywhere. Um, right. So we're thinking about different options for different places. So we are heading, we're almost out of time. And we have a few more questions. I apologize to folks uh, whose questions I we didn't get to, but this has just been a such a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Sasha. Do you have um, any final thoughts that you want to share with us today? How can people get involved? People are going to want to do something about this. Totally. Well, coming to things like this is amazing to, to feel the interest really matters to us. And I think being able to stay engaged with and communicate with and support organizations like the Nature Conservancy is a wonderful way to broaden our horizons and see what's out there. I think talking to decision makers and thinking about, you know, letting them know things that matter to you as you learn new things or think about things in a different way. Biocrusts are often not what we think about uh, a lot in our management, but, but knowing that people are interested um, and have questions really makes a big difference. Um, and then I think always, you know, letting your, I'm a federal scientist, I work for all of you, letting your uh, Congress or other folks know that you appreciate science, that you want science that can inform decision making. We don't get a lot, U.S. Geological Survey, we don't get a lot of love letters um, <laughs> about the, the work that we do and that, but that kind of communication to, uh, across all the scales that we're talking about can really matter. And so your interest just means the world to me. And um, I'm so excited uh, to be able to share this and people can always reach out to me with more questions or for more pictures or anything like that. The USGS doesn't get love letters. So we don't get a lot so of love letters. I feel like <laughs> We need to send all our scientists love. Them. <laughs> so yeah, so I would second that. So make sure that you let your Congress people know, your representatives know how much you really appreciate this work. I think that, you know, that's got to help. So listen, we're approaching the end of our time. And I just want to thank you for joining us. And I want to thank everyone who tuned in for your support of the Nature Conservancy. It's your support that makes all of this work possible. And um, we will be sending everyone a follow-up email over the coming days with a recording of this webinar. There were a few questions about that. People want to share it with their friends and family. Feel free to do that. We love to have you uh, share. And 
You can follow us on social media at conserve underscore MA on Facebook and Instagram. It's a good way to keep up with our work and to get updates on other webinars and virtual opportunities to connect with us. Um, to that end, I want to note that next Thursday at noon, we're going to have a conversation with Stephen Rothstein. He's the managing director for the series Accelerator. This is really different than what we did today. Steve is going to talk Talk about accelerators work on financial regulation, their successes and challenges, offer key initiatives of the accelerator, and how Massachusetts state agencies can play a role in the transition to a net zero future. What this is really about is making sure that when you're investing money, you're investing in, in uh, businesses, companies that are, are pledging to address climate change. You don't want to miss it, so sign up today at nature.org slash mawebinars. And I just want to thank you all again for joining us and hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody.